Hey, I'm Brian. And I'm Vanessa. Welcome to CityGate's Church Online Service. Uh, if you're watching this live, uh, just leave a comment down in the comment section. Um, we would just love to hear from you. It just adds to the online experience. You can also leave a comment anytime during the service, um, but just keeping it nice. Yeah, be nice. Comment fields can be, can be scary. Yeah. Um, if this is your first time joining us online, thanks so much for tuning in. We're so happy that you're here. Tuning in. Yeah, it's not on the radio. Uh, we would love to hear from you. So just head on over to citygates.ca slash guest. And um, we'd just love to hear how your experience was. We promise not to spam you. Yeah. Let's just go over some announcements. <laughs> Our community groups are happening every week. And um, if you're not part of one, you should be. Yeah, um, right now it seems not a lot of us are getting very much community interaction. So um, joining these groups is super important. Yeah, so for sure. So if you're not part of one, just head over to the website or you can actually use our app. Yes, that's the uh, Church Center app, right? Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> um, what else can you do for that? Um, so yeah, if you don't have it, you should download it. You can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, you can check into our online services. So that lets us know, you know, so you should do that right now. Check, Check in, in. Um, subscribe. and uh, like and subscribe. <laughs> you can watch our previous services or you can give. I shouldn't say or, and. and you can do all of those things. And. And more. And more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, like we heard from Mike last week, giving is super important. And um, us as City Gators, we've been so good at that. Thank you so much for those who've been giving generously. Yeah, and if you want to give, there's lots of ways to do it, which my wife will tell you all of the ways to do it. All of the ways to do it. So I believe you can sign up for monthly giving on our website. There's also the text to give option, as well as... The app. The app, the Church Center app. Of course, all the so things many you can ways. do. However, would we remember all of those ways? Um, I think there's a website, yeah. There is a website, yeah. Do you know the website? Um... CityGates.ca slash give. See? Super easy. Barely No, any... stop. Okay. Stop. Um, there's other ways to give back to the community as well, like the food bank. Yes. Uh, we partner with a food bank called The Storehouse. Um, cool. Yeah. And that's in partnership with other churches. Um, and the link is probably somewhere. One of the places where the links would be. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so when you, if you want to help out with the storehouse, um, there's a few ways you can do it. You can donate food items, you can donate financially, um, even donate by time by volunteering. You can volunteer to do the actual grocery runs for the food bank. Yeah, and there's also Victim Services Durham Region, um, and uh, that helps those that are in need right here in Durham. The link for that is citygates.ca slash VSDR, also super easy to remember. Yeah, let's, let's just pray now. Okay. All right, we're just going to pray. God, we just thank you that you're awesome and uh, that you love us so much. And we just pray that this service would be enriching to each and every person that's watching. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would be there uh, with everyone as we sing and as we hear from your word. In your name, amen. Amen. You are me, you are me. 
and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul rest in your embrace for i am yours and you are mine Well, hello City Gators and friends. My name is Vic and today I will be preaching. Um, we just finished the book of Ecclesiastes. We spent several weeks as a church going through that Old Testament book. 
Um, and so that is behind us. And now looking ahead, the next couple of weeks will actually be more um, directional. We're not going to preach specifically through uh, a book of the Bible as we are accustomed to. Um, but we're going to look at uh, subjects and uh, our messages will be more of a visionary nature just as we go into this next season um, as a church and knowing that things are, um, are still unusual. Uh, we just heard from uh, the venue that we usually rent on a Sunday that they won't be uh, permitting until January the 4th, uh, which means for the rest of the year at least um, uh, the, the venue that we've been accustomed to using uh, is not available to us even if uh, restrictions change. Uh, but all sorts of questions up in the air and so we just feel like it's a good time for us to, uh, to speak into our, our vision and our values, a reminder of what we are called to do and how we can do that in this current configuration. Um, so yeah, these are important weeks and I would love for every city gator um, to, to make an effort and to prioritize these uh, weeks going ahead. Uh, so let me pray and then uh, I'll start talking about today's subject. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for an opportunity uh, to still gather in this, uh, in this format. Um, I pray that you would help me to, to speak today and really communicate uh, aspects of your heart for our church and for those that are tuning in today. Lord, um, will you lead me? I, I surrender myself and my words to your Holy Spirit to, to guide me now and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to actually spend the next two weeks talking about sharing our faith, and um, the reasons for that will become more and more clear as the, the, um, the sermon goes on. Um, but just by way of introduction, uh, if you do know me, uh, I get pretty excited about things, um, most things. If you just put it in front of me for long enough and explain to me uh, what it's about and uh, uh, let me maybe experience it, whether it's a meal or it's a game. Uh, uh, very quickly, I'm into it to the extent that I want everyone else to be into it as well. Um, and so I, I remember long ago uh, being in Zimbabwe, doing ministry there. It's the country just north of South Africa. And, uh, and uh, listening to uh, how uh, farming uh, is being transformed by using biblical principles. It was called Farming God's Way, and then they changed it to Foundations for Farming as this principle was making its way into governments, and uh, they wanted it to be more accessible, especially for people who are, are either not Christians or, or are not uh, believers in God. Um, and so to get those principles in there, uh, am amazing things that teach people in rural areas with very little, uh, not just how to farm effectively to to, to, have, uh, to yield crops, but to actually uh, uh, sustain their homes, to, to sell some of the things. Um, and if that principle is applied in poorer nations and in rural areas, you know, nations that import food eventually could export food. It's just, it's, it's still going, it's very successful. And, and I remember just being so moved by that and wanting to become a farmer and just wanting to figure out a way. I was a city boy living in Johannesburg. I'm like, I'm sure I can farm my, my backyard a little bit, but that's just me. And, and you know, recently also, uh, we've, we've introduced something called Park Run to our local community because we discovered that in South Africa. It's like a 5K run every Saturday morning in a park. Um, doesn't matter what the weather's like. And so we, we launched one of those in our communities. And if I've spoken to you before, uh, I've probably mentioned Park Run and have invited you there, even though you may not be a runner yourself. But, um, you know, the things that I'm into, they, they do come and go. You know, I'm not that into farming anymore. I'm still into running. But um, there is one thing I know. Over the last nearly 25 years of my life, I have not lost a passion for, and I'm still as excited about it as I've been uh, from the moment I was introduced. And that is my passion for Jesus, my passion for his message, you know, telling others about him, and a passion for his model, his people, the church. Uh, that has not faded away. Um, and so every now and then I, I get, get asked to speak about that. This particular week, I was asked to speak to the staff uh, the, the, the national staff of, of Alpha uh, about personal evangelism. Now, I might have to just explain a few things here if you're a guest. Um, first of all, Alpha is this um, experience. It's a video series that churches use to help people discover the claims and teachings of Jesus. Um, it works like this. You, you, you sit around a table, you have a meal with some friends that invited you, and then you watch a short video clip, about 20 minutes, 
um, about a subject of the Christian faith, and then you discuss it uh, openly, and it, all opinions are welcome. It's actually designed for those who are not Christ followers, those who are not Christians. So that is Alpha. Um, and I spoke to them about personal evangelism. Again, as a guest, you might think evangelism, what, what is that word? Uh, well, um, it means to Christians just the, the principle of sharing our faith, of, of telling others about the good news of Jesus Christ. And of course, personal evangelism is your own story of how you do that in your life. And so they asked me to speak to them about personal evangelism. Now, it may not have struck you uh, quite yet, but there's a certain irony to that. Because Alpha uh, is, is an organization um, that produces evangelistic content for churches to use in their corporate evangelism. So as a church to, to tell others about Jesus. They produce the tools for that, and yet their staff members struggle to do it personally. And I thought about that. I thought if it's a challenge for the staff who works for an organization that produces content for churches to use to, to, to share their faith, how much more would it be challenging? And, and I know it's true because I've spoken to many of you. I know it's challenging for those in churches, Christian churches, to share their faith personally. We can often lean on this corporate experience so much that our personal stories does not include any any uh, aspects of evangelism and sharing our faith. We think it's up to the leaders, it's up to the church, the organization, the events that we put up, um, the initiatives that we do, and we do not do them ourselves apart from that. And so I wanted to actually spend some time talking about that because that's really one of the, if not the primary thing that we ultimately are about as a church. Um, and, uh, you know, they asked me a question at the end of the, the, uh, the session about what I felt the Holy Spirit was saying and doing in the church, not just globally, but in particular, the church in Canada. And uh, I don't consider myself very prophetic. I'm not a prophet of sort, but I actually surprised myself as I started speaking about what I sense God's doing, the, the level of excitement in me um, as I described what I believe the, uh, as a real prospect and what's happening is that a, a multitude of messengers uh, carrying the gospel message uh, uh, is, is being raised up by God in this time that is not dependent on a few mega moments, even maybe online moments or, or, or centered around major ministries and major personalities, but like these, these mini conversations, millions of mini moments across Canada, across the world, where Jesus is shared by mediocre men and women. Now, yeah, you, I think you heard correctly. I just called uh, yourself and myself mediocre average people. And I think that's a wonderful thing because, I mean, the Bible even tells us that Jesus came as a pretty average Joe. Uh, and so often we can think that it's only the exceptional people who share, share Jesus, the people with major platforms and with chiseled jaws and chins and uh, uh, um, uh, a major following. But actually, God wants to work through extraordinary, wants to work extraordinarily through ordinary people. Um, and uh, and I, I'm so excited about that possibility. Uh, this is what, what God always wanted for the church, it just, just to, to, for, the, for everyone, every person, uh, average as they are, to share the extraordinary message of Jesus. It, it, the wonderful thing is, is that when we're average, God gets all the credit and all the glory. It's not anything in and of ourselves. And so I'm, I'm very excited about that prospect. And this week I was listening to a podcast by a, a, a person um, uh, that's a member of the Gospel Coalition, uh, a British uh, minister, uh, kind of just talking about how culture has shifted over the last decade or two um, and sharing the, the news that you and I uh, do know firsthand is that it's not very um, popular anymore. It's not very possible to invite someone to uh, a major event. It's, it's getting, getting harder and harder uh, for people to just attend a major event that we put up as a church, as an organization, a, a, a community of faith, where we do share the gospel, but to get people there is, is getting more and more tough, harder and harder. And I know that, yes, we've moved online, many churches have, and that has removed some of the barriers that people have you know, they wouldn't darken the doorway of the church, but they might log on to an online service. Maybe you are one of those right now as a guest. Uh, no one knows you with, with us, but uh, it's easier for you to join us online than it is to join us in person. I do recognize that. But 
I just want to remind our people or remind the Christians listening today that it has never been, it's never meant to be about coming to church. That is not like what Christianity ultimately is about. Uh, Jesus commanded the church, which is the people of God, to go. He didn't say, you must come to church. He said, church, go to the people. Um, and so it was never about events and about these uh, uh, special things that we put up in hope that people would arrive and show up to them. Who and what the real church is, is is graciously being put to to test in this season, this COVID season, that we find ourselves in this pandemic. And uh, uh, I think how much more is that statement a a reality now that the church is meant to go, now that there aren't really churches to go to? (laughs) Like our problem, for example, we have no physical venue, at least not big enough to have all of us there in uh, in there together. We have the waypoint, but it's a lot smaller. Um, And so... How are we doing as a church uh, in following the mandate uh, and, and, the, and the command that Jesus gave his disciples to go and make disciples instead of thinking everybody must come to us? So the question is, who and what are we, city gators? So let me just remind you, uh, we exist to help people find and follow Jesus. Do, do you guys remember this booklet? Um, this is our We Are document. And in here, it outlines our manifesto. We are helping people find and follow Jesus. And we do that through, through being a, a Holy Spirit-dependent servants of Jesus. We do that through being a hospitable family of Jesus. We do that through being a strategic missionaries for Jesus. And we do that by being devoted disciples to Jesus. All of those things so that we could help others find and follow Jesus. This used to be a thing. Remember that. And if you're a guest here today, uh, this should be good news to you because I've just told you that CityGates primarily exists for you. We exist to help you as a guest, as someone who's exploring Christianity. You wouldn't consider yourself a Christian. You might not even believe in God. We as an organization, City Gates, we exist for you primarily, not just for us. And so that should, should, should be a good news and at least make you smile a little bit. But let's just be honest, City Gates, that, that this whole pandemic season, this COVID season, um, has actually robbed us of our mission mojo, I feel, to some extent. Um, and let me just say, we, we really care about you, City Gators. We want you to be mature in the faith. We want you to, to grow in your faith. We want you to move from milk to solid food. That is how, you know, the letter to the Corinthians and how Paul uh, writes uh, to the, he- uh, well, not Paul, we don't know who wrote the Hebrews, but uh, the book uh, Hebrews. But in chapter 5, verse 12, he talks about mature, solid food instead of milk. Um, and, and, and so often people think that's what church is ultimately about. Is this where I get fed, I, you know, I get the meat. Um, but, but here's the deal. A, a guy called John Wimber, he said this, the meat is in the street. And, and, and the point he's trying to make is that Christian maturity and the mission are connected. Maturity and the mission are connected. So it's like exercising and eating. If you just eat, you just eat, 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 and you don't exercise, What happens? We all know you gain weight because the food is the fuel for functioning. That's why you eat. And so if the food is not converted into energy, what happens? Well, you gain weight. You, you, it turns into fat. And so we have to be careful as Christians, especially in this time where it's so easy to just consume content, that we don't become spiritually obese, ever consuming what comes at us at our screens, but becoming in the process less and less effective, less and less mobile. So here's the thing. Because when we function, and, I, and as, an, as, an, as a runner myself, um, when you function, when you exercise, it actually produces an appetite in you. You, you eat more as you exercise more, or you, you eat more often. You eat better. You, uh, you, you're almost like your, your appetite doesn't just get uh, um, bigger, but the things you want are better as well. And so you grow when you go. You mature when you, when you, when you move, when you're on mission. Philemon uh, chapter 6 says this. This is Paul's prayer uh, for him. He says, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. There you have it. He's saying, I want you to share your faith because as you share your faith, you will become effective 
for knowing every good thing that is in us for Christ Jesus. He's saying you will become mature when you are on mission. And often we think it's the other way around. It's like, no, I first need to be mature and then I should go on mission. It actually, they happen side by side. And uh, as a church, who are de- we're devoted disciples, meaning we want to make disciples. We want to help people follow Jesus. That's what a disciple is. You might think, oh, that's not me. I cannot do it. I don't know enough. But in order for someone to follow you, you just have to be one step further ahead than them. Think about that. You just have to know one thing more than someone else in order for, to lead them into that thing you know. And so everybody can make disciples. Everybody can share their faith with someone else that's maybe a few steps behind them. And so I wanted to actually just read Psalm 51, verse 9 to 15. Um, for me, uh, it'll, it'll make sense as to why I'm reading that. Uh, and then after that, I want to share you just a brief history of, of, of what sharing my faith has been like over the last uh, nearly 25 years of being a Christian. But if you have your Bibles with you, let's read Psalm 51 together. Uh, I'm going to read from verse 9 all the way to verse 15. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. This is God's word, and I've only read a few verses out of Psalm 51. The context there really is, uh, 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 David's been a bad boy, he sinned, and uh, this is a psalm that he wrote uh, in, 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 uh, in repentance. And uh, I will join the dots in a moment as to what this is. But first, let me just share uh, very briefly my history in, uh, in, in sharing my faith over these last few years. And, and maybe this will be helpful for you. Maybe you'll find yourself in my story as I share it with you. When I started out, uh, I became a Christian in my late teens. Let's just say around sort of grade 12 area, uh, a season of my life. And, uh, and initially, um, as a young Christian, I was very blown away by God's grace and uh, I remember sitting in a church one day listening to an evangelist, the person who's really gifted in sharing their faith with others. Um, and they wrote a book and I bought the book and the book was full of stories of how this person just shared the gospel with people on the street, wherever they went. And I was really emboldened by that. But I look back at how I worked it out and I blush a little bit as to what it was like initially. And maybe your reason for not being uh, evangelistic in nature, not sharing your faith could be because of people like me back in those days. I remember standing in line at the McDonald's and as I, you know, people behind me, people in front of me, as it uh, was my turn to order a meal, I think I ordered one, but then I also said to the lady, hey, would you like to, you know, order Jesus in many ways? Would you like to follow Jesus? And she was like, uh, what do you mean? And I, I gave like some half-baked, few seconds version of it. And she's like, yeah, sure. I think she felt pressure because She's got a job to do. And so I said, give me your hand and we could still do that. And I just prayed with her, said, say this after me. And, you know, took my Big Mac and sat down. And it was like, a, I think, you know, I just led someone to Jesus. I don't know how real that was. And I don't know how anybody in the line felt about that moment. Um, there was another time as well. Uh, I was like 1997. And, uh, and, I, and I remember the news that Princess Diana had passed away, that she had died in an accident, uh, was on the news. Uh, and someone, I can't remember who it was, just around me just said, hey, did you hear Princess Diana died. And my first response was, did you hear that Jesus Christ is alive? And I proceeded to, to, to you know, speak to them about that. And maybe that was a little insensitive, you know, because you know, it was sad news and perhaps this person was uh, shocked by it. And I just didn't care about that, really. I just moved straight into the gospel. And so I would say that's probably not how to do it. None of those people I remember. I certainly did not walk a road with them. Uh, and, uh, and that was kind of how I started out. And as I grew, uh, you know, over time in my, in my faith, I started volunteering in a local church and I moved from a volunteer ministry position eventually to being on staff. You know, some years later, I, I came on staff at a church as a pastor as, um, and uh, something happened. Um, eventually, I was surrounded by Christians primarily. 
And, and I found myself in a bit of a bubble where actually I no longer interacted with people who, who had different, different opinions to me um, or who were not believers in God, certainly not followers of Jesus. And so my message at that stage, you know, what I did primarily as a Christian was I was trying to turn other people into better Christians. I was actually someone who facilitated a spiritual obesity. You know, I just said, hey, be more involved and you need to come to this meeting and do that. And, 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 and I felt like the primary thing I was doing was actually just force feeding Christians, uh, but not actually helping them get on to mission. Um, and I turned in that season into what I would call an older brother. It's not my term. It's something Jesus used when he uh, told the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. The story is really just about uh, uh, a son who says to his, his dad, I, I want to enjoy um, my inheritance. Give it to me now. He took, the, um, took that from the father and he you know, spent it on sex, drugs and rock and roll. Um, um, but his older brother stayed behind faithfully serving the Father. And, you know, it's a story of grace because this young one uh, comes back and, uh, and the Father just accepts him and doesn't make him earn his status back as a son and he throws a big party for him. But then this older brother is outside um, and, uh, and is actually not enjoying the feast, the party of, of, a, of, a, of a lost son being found. And um, it's amazing that the Father, as he ran to, to embrace the younger son as he came home. He also left the party to go and get the older son. And the story ends, we don't know if the older son ever made its way into the party, but I was that older son outside thinking, God, I'm working so hard for you and I don't feel like uh, I'm being blessed. And, and actually I had lost sight of the grace of God. And God came out of the party and, and invited me back into the joy of seeing people coming to know him, seeing lost sons being found, lost children being found. Um, and, uh, and I'm so grateful for that moment. And it changed because from that time onwards, I mean, I, I realized I needed the gospel. I had grown proud as a Christian, thought I'm better, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm living a good life. And in doing so, in many ways, I expected God to bless me in my ministry. Um, but I, I realized I'm as in need of grace as the, the furthest away every day, as the person that's the furthest away from God. And so it actually, it was a gospel renaissance moment for me. It was like the gospel was two-dimensional. The gospel was like a distant thing for me. It's like something you do when you become a Christian and you hear when you become a Christian, and then you move on to, to, uh, to living a certain way to sort of uh, uh, keep God you know, uh, uh, loving you and, and for, you to, for you to remain in God's good books. And it was such a wrong view of it. And so the gospel became, went from 2D to 3D in many ways. Like I, I saw, saw the dimensions of God's grace. And this distant event of my salvation in my late teens became a daily reality for me again. As I wake up and I realize oh, I'm a sinner saved by God's grace. I, there's new mercies for me today. It was a fresh understanding of my need and my dependency on God's grace. And if you're listening as a guest today, this is what we want you to experience. that The, the daily uh, mercies and the grace of of the Father in His Son, Jesus, that we live out of and live from. I still do that. And so to bring it back to Psalm 51, like I said, David had sinned, and this is a, a, a psalm of repentance. Um, verse 12 happened to me. Verse 12 read, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. It was a sense that years after I'd become a Christian, I had no longer joy in my salvation. I'd taken it for granted. And God restored my joy. And that changed everything for me. I could not only see parts of my life where I have obviously not believed the gospel and I've let go of the gospel and, and I could not only see the parts in my life where I needed the gospel, but again, I had fresh eyes and I could see the relevance of the gospel to those around me who are no longer, who are no, not Christians yet rather. Uh, and I could see the false gospels in their lives, how they are believing uh, uh, lies about fulfillment and happiness and redemption and all those things that the culture is throwing at them. I could see the false gospels in their lives, and I wanted to share the real gospel with them. I had a new desire to share. And that's amazing. Psalm 51, 13, verse 13, happened to me. After he says, restore me the joy of your salvation, what happened? He says, uh, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. 
verse 13. Verse 14, he says, Lord, open my lips. For, for, suddenly my lips were opened up. My eyes were opened up and I wanted to share the gospel. And it was now way more relational than my silly uh, early years, you know, where it was like hit and run evangelism. And by the way, relational evangelism, so sharing your faith uh, in relationship with others, is really just the part of making disciples that precedes people coming to faith. When we make disciples of others, we, we walk a road with them, introducing them to the claims and teachings of Christ. And relational evangelism is the bit of discipleship before they say yes to Jesus. Uh, it's it's that, that journey that you walk with them. So you are making disciples when you are relationally evangelistic, if I can put it that way. And for that, you need time with someone. You, it's not this hit and run thing where I don't even need to know your name. Um, and I, all I have is a one-liner to give to you. And it's always the same little thing. Actually, there's more depth to the gospel that way. Um, as you see the specific needs in the people's lives that you love and, and walk alongside with, and you, and you see the specific sins that they are committing that Jesus died for. So it's not just Jesus died on the cross for your sins, but as you get to know someone, you, you say to them, Jesus died on the cross for this particular thing you're doing in your life that you are trying to find fulfillment in, and only Jesus can give it to you. You are, you are, you are denying the existence of God and what God has done for you in the pursuit of happiness along these lines, and Jesus can rescue you from that. That requires relationship with people. And that is what we as a church want, to help people find and follow Jesus. We have to walk alongside people. And if you're a guest here, we want to walk alongside you. And so I'm going to just quickly end off by telling you what I believe uh, uh, evangelism is not. Okay, in case you think, okay, well, how do I do this? How do I share my faith? Let me tell you what it isn't. And then next week, I'm going to tell you what it is. So I'm going to share some, some tips, some personal tips, and some biblical uh, counsel as to how you can do that in your own life. Um, and so this is what I believe it is not. Um, to share your faith with someone is not simply telling them that you're a Christian. Okay, in, in, in a pluralistic society that we live in, that can just mean that you are European, that you're a Western. Sometimes even people can think, oh, if you're a Christian, it means you're from the West. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, that, that doesn't equal evangelism. Uh, it's not saying to someone that you believe in God. Just, and there you go, you've done your bit. No, the Bible tells us even demons believe in God. That means that demons are evangelists according to that definition. It's not true. I have people uh, who live in my neighborhood and they uh, are very comfortable with the idea that a God exists, but it does not mean that they follow Jesus. Um, evangelism is not uh, uh, you know, saying grace or, um, or praying before a meal you know, of the rehearsed kind, you know, just saying the same things every single time uh, as a matter of tradition. Uh, because I have some neighbors who actually are far more disciplined. They pray five times a day outside of meal contexts. So just doing that doesn't mean you're an evangelist. Um, it's not saying to people that you go to church. We all know that going to church can be as routine as going to Costco every week. Just because you go to church doesn't mean that you are evangelizing, telling people about Jesus and the good news. And, and certainly evangelism is not saying to someone or, or, or being proud of the fact that you don't drink, cuss, smoke, or chew, or go with boys or girls who do. Okay, That is a moralistic uh, sort of outlook and saying Christianity is about living a certain way. I can tell you with all honesty that there are people who do not follow Jesus that I would consider better human beings than myself. If it's all about morality, well, then I'm not a Christian, certainly. I, I'm full horribly short of, of not just God's standards, but some of the wonderful people that live around me. That is not evangelism. Those things may lead to evangelistic conversations, but they do not equal evangelism. Just like uh, inviting someone somewhere is part of evangelism. Hey, come with me somewhere. Come with me to Alpha. Come with me to, to, to uh, our online church. Join me online. But that doesn't equal evangelism. It's a part of the evangelistic process. So what is evangelism then? Well, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, evangelism is an announcement of good news. It's an announcement of good news. It comes from the Greek, ver uh, a Greek word for a messenger um, who would often deliver the news that a battle is won. 
they would be arriving just says, we have won the war, we have won the, the battle. And, and, a, and, a, and an evangelist, in that sense of the word, was always someone, always someone who brought glad tidings, happy news. And Psalm 51 is an example of that, of, of God's forgiveness. I've been forgiven. It's an announcement of what has taken place. And so let me just use a Trumpism uh, today. We need to make the good news great again. I think in terms of, 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 of sharing our faith, Actually, to be convinced yourself, that was the gospel renaissance I went through, that God is gracious and merciful and you can see His mercy and His grace at work in your life on a daily basis, blown away by God's mercy and kindness, blown away by what Jesus has done for you and, and that you walk forgiven as a result. If you're convinced yourself, that is convincing. Others will go, what's going on here? That in itself draws people. The Holy Spirit uses that. And so the question is, does the good news still grip you? Because there's no sharing your faith if that's not true. If you do not have a Psalm 51 moment, if, the, if you have not recent good news to share of God's grace, relevant in the now, like David's story of his sins being forgiven, having a wow moment, you know, you have not made the good news great again. And you need to be gripped by the good news. That is what it is. It's sharing that good news of God's involvement in your life. Uh, uh, evangelism is uh, technically uh, not even a closing the deal. Sometimes you think that uh, to, to, to share your faith means that you need to, um, you need to uh, 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 where was I? <laughs> sharing your faith means that you need to close a deal. Like at, at the end of that, someone needs to become a Christian. Actually, that's ultimately God's job. Uh, those early years of sharing my faith, that's what I believed. I believe that it's only real evangelism if somebody says yes and comes to faith. And so I bypassed the relationship and I kind of cornered people, forced them into a corner to just say yes, but they didn't necessarily mean it. Uh, and I wasn't actually sharing good news, my good news, certainly not. And so that's the thing. Our lives is and our lives should be a headline. Your life should be a testimony of your own event of God's grace. And, uh, you know, if someone coming to faith is a fork in, in the road of their lives, where they choose, choose life, you know, go through the narrow door, uh, uh, Jesus, if that's, that, that's that moment, actually leading up to that moment, I've spoken about this before, there are many crossroads or like intersections where, where the story of God, the, the gospel intersects with their lives and they have an opportunity to, to take a, 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 an off-ramp, to, to follow a God's perspective on some aspect or allow him in into that moment. And there are often many little crossroads. So evangelism is often praying to, to see those crossroads in the lives of the people that you share your faith with. Because they might end up at the fork in the road, but before they get there, they need to take a few uh, uh, turns as they follow the truth, as they follow the trail of truth. Uh, and, uh, and so evangelism is just sharing your own trails of truth and praying that you recognize the trails of truth in their lives as well, those crossroads, those intersections. Um, that is what I do when I pray. Uh, actually, my alarm just went off here. Uh, it's a discipline at 11.02 every day. So this is, I'm recording it at this time. Uh, I pray for the people that I'm sharing my, the faith with at the moment, uh, that God's kingdom would come. That's Luke chapter 11, verse 2. Uh, every day I, I pray for that. And, it, and it's by means of seeing the crossroads, the intersections in their lives. And then lastly, um, evangelism is not just for those with the gift. If you've read your Bibles, if you understand how the Holy Spirit works, uh, he, he gives gifts to people. And one of the gifts is the gift of evangelism. Some people just have that gift. Maybe I have that, where they just are good at and, they, and, and there's such joy in sharing their faith with others. But actually, we see Paul writes to a man called Timothy, who was known to have the gift of shepherding or pastoring more than anything else. And he said to Timothy, you do the work of an evangelist. And so there's a sense that every Christian has the responsibility to share their faith, although some Christians have a real gift to do so. This is not just for people who have the gift. This is for every believer. Just like the principle of giving is something everybody should do because we've been given grace, there are some people with the gift of generosity. They're able to make lots of money and give lots of it away more than others do. Um, but that doesn't mean only those people should be the givers. 
it's, a, it's something that every Christian should do as a discipline. And I want to end with that, that this is something that all of us should do. Because if you're a part of City Gates, you said yes to the call to help others find and follow Jesus. Not just the people who have the gift of evangelism. And so uh, next week, I'm going to be sharing some of those biblical tools on how you could be uh, an ordinary evangelist. But let me pray, uh, and I trust you will have some good discussion times in your community groups this week as well. Father, thank you for your, uh, your, your great commission that you have called us all to share the good news. And Lord, we may have lost sight of that over this last little while as we just try to stay afloat as a church. But will you help us to get back to the main thing? Will you help us to, to each one of us, be evangelists? Um, because that is the, the, the hope uh, that we have right now. There are no real other means for us to share other than these many moments of, 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 of every single uh, Christian uh, sharing the story of Jesus saving them and, uh, and, and announcing that good news. Will you make us more courageous as a church than ever before? And I pray that you would uh, teach us and, and open doors for us to do this more and more uh, into this next season. In your name I pray. Amen. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, the silence.